Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending August 31st. This is the end of Season 6 and the beginning of Season 7. I have a guest with me. He was also the co-host of the TDD Report on Season 4 for the entire season. Welcome, Mick. And uh, First up, I'm going to talk about um, a story that was sent by Navy Thomas, and then we're going to talk about two Australian-related stories. Navy Thomas sent me in a video from JPL about September night sky and the different objects in the sky and what you can see. But the most interesting thing, if you watch this short video, is it gives an update about Comet Ison and the fact that it's going to actually pass directly over Mars. And during that time it's passing over, they're going to try to grab shots from the Mars Curiosity rover and also from the Mars Surveyor satellite. So maybe they'll get some very good shots. I also noticed they're still not telling us how dramatic it's going to be. They're not going to commit to that. So we still don't know when it reaches the closest point to Earth if we're going to see as good of a view as we did with Comet Hale-Bopp. But keeping our fingers crossed, maybe we will get a good view of the comet besides. But to me, even if they get some good shots from the surface of Mars or from the satellite circling Mars, to me that will be a major win. So the stories we're going to talk about right now, what was the first one we're going to talk about? The currency? Yeah. Yeah, the Australian currency. And Mick has brought along some currency, and he's going to tell us a little bit of facts about the different bills he has brought along. So which one do you want to talk about first? Well... What do you think of the color of them, for starters, compared to the U.S.? Let's take a jars? look at this here. Isn't that pretty? I mean, compared to our bills, the U.S. bills have been pretty much not changed since the 20s and 30s. All kinds of different colors. It's also got this kind of transparent thing. And uh, he had me do something curious with it. He said, go and take it and hold it underneath the faucet. I held it under the faucet, and the water was just beating off, although this feels like paper. It feels exactly like paper. Yeah, it's... Um it's a, made of a polymer plastic, and it looks like paper, it feels like paper, but uh, it's far stronger. You can tear it, but uh, it's very, uh, very difficult to do. As, as you say, you can get wet, and uh, the water just beads straight off it. Um, now, Australia went to a, a decimal currency, this sort of money, back in 1966. I was in the third grade at the time, so we uh, moved from a, a currency called pounds, shillings and pence, which we... Uh, pretty much inherited from Great Britain. But uh, in 1966 we went uh, to decimal currency and uh, our um, paper money was made of paper in, at that stage and I think it was 1988 if I remember correctly that we moved over to this new polymer type uh, uh, money. The uh, little plastic window that you see in there Chuck is um, that's part of the um, security um, for, forging uh, Australian money is very, very difficult to do. Uh, being able to get that plastic window in there exactly the same makes it difficult. Uh, also, if you hold a, each of the notes under a blue light, there's a security number that comes up onto it. So that in, in itself makes it very difficult to, uh, to make forgeries of. So um, these banknotes are made in Melbourne. We have basically two places. Uh, we have the Royal Australian Mint in Canberra that makes the coins and uh, Banknotes bank Australia make the notes in, in Melbourne. So uh, not only do we do Australian money but they also make um, the Australian passports and they also make currencies for other countries. Cool. And uh, the last story that we wanted to talk about has to do with the longest experiment ever running and I've talked about this many many times in the past if you remember a few TDD reports ago I talked about the fact that Ireland kind of got the jump on uh, the pitch drop experiment because they actually filmed a pitch drop actually dropping whereas the last time one did in this experiment from uh, Queensland was uh, the cameras actually malfunctioned and they didn't even get to uh, see it happen well the professor himself I believe his name is John Mainstone right? That's he, it. He uh, was the um, one that was looking over the experiment, but something happened recently. Yes, uh, John Mainstein passed away from a stroke at the age of 78. Pardon me for reading this, but uh, my uh, brain's in such a foggy state after my trip over to the States. So, uh, yeah, it's a very sad story. Professor Mainstein passed away at the age of 78, and uh, another young professor from uh, Caboolture, which is a suburb uh, of north, north side of Brisbane, uh, now where this pitch drop experiment is going on is fairly close to where you live, right? Yeah, it's at the University of Queensland in the city of Brisbane and uh, uh, Professor Mainstone's replacement is Professor Andrew White who's uh, from the uh, uh, northern suburb of uh, Caboolture. So, um, 
um, apparently this uh, this this experiment experiment has uh, uh, has formed just nine drops in 81 years, and uh, uh, it's recognised by the Guinness uh, World Book of Records as the longest running running experiment in the world. So uh, Professor Mainstone uh, began his Virgil in 1961. Um, now, I'm just reading here, has he ever seen a drop fall, or did he miss no, one? No, he's never, he's never actually seen one himself, and uh, the last one they missed, the camera is not working, so I'm thinking with the new professor that's taking over, I hope you make sure there's at least three cameras running around the clock so they at least catch it on film, if not. He's saying he might actually get to see it himself. I don't know if they can predict when it reaches a certain length, and the other thing they're having a problem with the experiment is uh, the professor, before he died, was actually... Um, thinking of lowering the, the beaker a little bit farther down because they think one thing slowing it down is the pitch drop itself is actually going to touch the bottom before it breaks off and they've been debating about whether to lower it down if that would affect it or not or would stretch the drop or something like that so that's the big debate now as to whether to have it lower down enough so that it could entirely free fall into the beaker so that's the one debate of that story you know um, a lot of things going on in the world, but we're debating whether to lower a beaker on a pitch drop experiment. But still, for us geeks, I mean, to me it's something interesting. Yeah, and I would say that would also qualify as the most boring uh, hobby ever. Yeah, to be hired as a... Imagine being an understudy student to actually sit in a chair in front of that and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Not that they probably have that. But anyway, um, thank you, Mick, for being with me, and he will probably be with me for the next week's TDD report, too. So, um, nice having a co-host right here live with me instead of... Uh, on camera from Brisbane. So take care everybody. I will catch you next week.